Hello and welcome to the See For Yourself podcast, the only podcast where all of our threesomes involve twins in a hot tub. I am your host, Egad, and uh, I am joined by... I, I'm that guy that works for Oreo that recommended putting even more stuff in there, and they fired me. Thank God. Get get this man out of uh, the Oreo business, because it's it's more cookie, not more stuffing. Quit trying I, mean, to... I, I just disagree. I've... <laughs> <laughs> I've never been more offended by a by an opinion that like has no bearing on my life whatsoever. <laughs> the 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 movie for today that we're going to be going over is Itchy the Killer. I'll go ahead and give the blurb really quick, and then we can get right into it. Hey, uh, just uh, just be careful about that blurb because I was looking at the blurbs just to make sure nothing was spoiled too too much, and a lot of the blurbs just tell you it all. Okay, I have a pretty short one here, so let's. Fortunately, I'm a. Uh, I'm kind of a pro at this at this point. Ooh. A sadomasochistic uh, Yakuza enforcer comes across a repressed and psychotic killer who may be able to inflict levels of pain the enforcer can only dream about. And that is our blurb. So for this episode, I have not seen the movie ever. And uh, I believe Mr. S- Oreo Stuffin, Oreo McStuffins over here. <laughs> uh, yes, I, uh, I, I saw this when I was younger. I had a good friend whose family was really big into horror movies they had a back room that was just a shrine to you know the classic ones Candyman and all that stuff like that and went over his house and we watched itchy the killer i remember it being like a really grotesque movie for me at the time and then when i when i looked up the like the genre it's in it's like uh like crime action and i was like i don't remember that at all there was a really big boom in the 1970s, and we'll probably have to watch a lot of these movies, actually, for uh, crime films in Japan. And Itchy the Killer is a movie made in Japan, and it takes place in Japan. So this could be sort of like, I guess, maybe the end of that wave of movies about like crime and whatnot. And the history of film, as, as we've seen, at least in American film, I, I can't uh, speak too much for Japanese film, but for American film, it's very commonplace for a movie movie to start off in a very realistic and like easily understood place and then by the end of like that series of movies or by the end of like that genre of movies not really the end of them but like the climax of that genre of movies we get to a place where it becomes absurd and crazy and over the top and itchy the killer might just be experiencing that where it's still in that like appreciation for crime genre you know following people performing crimes or following detectives investigating crimes but itchy the killer has gotten to the point where like well we've done all this other stuff what do we do now and like i don't know just like throw a bucket of blood on top of it fuck <laughs> so the the main guy the the sadomasochistic yakuza man he had a vi- i don't know what you'd call it but it's like a body modification thing so kind of like shark gills how they just sort of flap open his cheeks have that and there's there's a scene that looks really cool where he's just smoking a cigarette and like he exhales through the shark gills and i was like that's really cool i'm gonna go do that that's that's the body modification that i want to do that's badass and come to find out that's like not a thing you can really do because you've got like saliva glands in your cheeks that you'd have to like cauterize dead and and you just end up drooling out of your fucking mouth uh, out of your cheek holes all the time and so so it's not something you can do i bring that up because do do you think this sadomasochistic part is going to be like a big part of the movie like do you think this is just going to be sexual gratification for somebody oh god i hope so i hope that the sadomasochist guy is just like strolling along his day and he's like Man, I sure want to, like, torture people and or have them torture me, depending on, like, you know, how far he dips into one or the other. And he comes across this fellow and he's like, wowzers, you seem to really be good at this. Could you, like, I don't know, just do what you love doing in front of me? And, like, the killer guy is just like, yeah, I could do that. That sounds perfectly reasonable, old chum. They shake hands and they and they're do 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 like a Mickey Mouse kind of like Steamboat Willie, <laughs> just, just like just like jollily, very very happy, just sort of sauntering on during the day. And they see some homeless person. They're like, hey, he probably doesn't have any you know anything better to do. Let me go chop his fingers off and eat them. And he, he, the the sadomasochist guy is just like, oh yes, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I I would love for that to be the case, but I feel like maybe maybe not because it's well, goddamn man, it's a Japanese movie. We have to like, you have to go into this 
and it was made in 2001. So like they're fully embracing like, hey, we're into weird sex stuff, whatever. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I feel like that's a, a valid thing to do because like the Yakuza is like, I know that it's such a, a standardized thing in media now, but I feel like in Japan, it's not something that they publicly embrace. You know what I mean? It's hard to say. Japan historically has gone through periods of like just big old orgies and we're going to paint them while they're happening. And it's man on man, man on woman, man on animal. We don't give a fuck. And then the next generation will come around and they'll be like, wow, we are disgusted by that last generation. We're going to go to go to work. We're going to be respectful to our elders. We're going to raise a family. I'm not going to say I love you to my wife. That would be a little too romantic, too indecent. And then the next generation sees the past one and they're like, well, we want to live a little bit more hedonistically and it's not like a one for one thing sometimes it's multiple generations but like you can find a historical precedent for this in japan and then the 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 issue arrives where like eventually after this has happened enough times what you're describing where you're like well yeah they might be like very sexually expressive people but like only privately and not openly and that's as a result of well i am a sexually expressive person but i know that like there are people around me like my grandparents or my children or whatever who are very judgy about this type of shit so i have to be very secretive about it so that might be what you're what you're describing here where you're like well i always thought they were pretty private about that stuff they're only very private about it because they're worried about the generation before them and the generation after them that they at this point know are going to be prudes <laughs> right but that's just you know my uh, my take on it i could be entirely incorrect and i'm perfectly willing to be incorrect about that i am i am interested to see cuz we've seen american movies about yakuza things and the yakuza e comings and goings. I'm excited to see an actual Japanese movie about what's going on with the Yakuza. I imagine in 2001, it's still going to be somewhat stylized and like there's going to be certain things that are like, we're going to try to make the Yakuza look cooler than they were in real life. Yeah, I, I don't even think that's just a Japanese thing. It's like, you know, I, we, we have really cool cowboy movies and none of them touch on the fact that these were like dirty homeless vagrants. They were specifically gross people. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, I imagine, I guess as one of my, my, my more reasonable predictions, I imagine the Yakuza sadomasochist will probably be that way as a result of his job, or maybe that's how he stumbled upon that aspect of his uh, sexual preferences. He gets a job at the Yakuza, he's working for the Yakuza, they go, hey, you gotta go and like, this guy's not paying us his protection money, go and break his legs. He breaks the guy's legs and he's just like, ooh, something about that. <laughs> I'm hoping that there will be a scene where we get that, where they're like, you know, he's over here just like, you know, jamming his thumbs into somebody's eyes. And he's like, how did this all get started? And then he thinks back to that first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're wondering how I've gotten here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not that exactly. Maybe we'll like it'll it'll follow it chronologically. Like, well, the movie will start off with him doing that, and then we'll just keep following him, and he'll just over the course of the film. You know, I don't know, but I I do want to see his first time. You know, realizing like, wow, this is great. There's um, you you mentioned like probably jokingly about him being like, oh, and he met this killer guy, and and they just had a grand old time. Do you think that they're gonna they're gonna meet like pretty early and team up, or do you think this is uh? <laughs> Like, are they going to be rivals in this? Where he's like, I wanted to be the the most uh, sexually obscene character in this movie. And then the killer guy goes, no, I'm going to do that. And they fight about it. I'm trying to give realistic predictions here. I think what will probably happen is the, we'll be introduced to the Yakuza guy. He will sort of be given a job by the boss and maybe he's unable to complete it or he's having some sort of difficulty with it. And so he sort of like enlists the help of this killer guy for some reason or another. Maybe they come across each other on the street or he He's like, well, I can't complete this job, but I know a guy maybe who can, or maybe like a friend of his knows a guy who can, and that's that's how they get introduced to each other. But they get introduced to each other some way or some other, and then he's just like, wow, this guy really does the torturing thing really well, so we're just going to buddy up and like slap hands and become... It's going to be a buddy cop movie. This is a buddy cop movie, man. <laughs> buddy cop movie, you think? <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that the guy who played Itchy uh, in this movie, he won like a lot of awards and whatnot for 
for it. Like he's gotten a lot of recognition for his portrayal of this character. Yeah, uh, I can see that. I, I didn't hear about that till you just mentioned it, but I can definitely see that. So since since we're talking about uh, you know this the sadomasochistic preferences of the two main characters here, do you think they're gonna have their own private life that we're that we're gonna see? Do you think there's gonna be a love interest for either of them? I think one of them has to right. So the way that these normally work in buddy cop movies, I'm just full blown on the buddy cop theory. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is samurai cop again. <laughs> this is our this is our seventeenth week doing a samurai cop movie. <laughs> it's like yeah, personization. So- how everything reverts to being a crab. Everything just becomes samurai cop. Yeah, we're all just devolving back to samurai cop. Yeah. So normally the way that that works in in that type of a movie though is that one of them has like a home life that's like interesting and they have like a romance and stuff that we actually get to explore and whatnot. And the other one is like a loner and he doesn't have that. I think it'd be kind of cool to have like the, the the sexy Yakuza member guy who's like, I'm I'm a sadomasochist and I just need this dude. Oh, wow. He's so good at it to have like a like a, a very nice home life with like a wife and kids and whatnot. And then you have to kind of wonder like, does does his wife get in on this? Like, is she that lady gets, <laughs> yeah, like she gets down, you know? Or is she, is she a prude and the only way he's able to gratify himself is by working for the Yakuza? Yeah, it's got to be one or the other. And then like maybe Itchy like meets them and he's just like, dog, I kind of want to like chop off all of your kids is like arms and legs and like feed them to them and like <laughs> the, the sadomasochist guy's like yeah, maybe maybe don't bring this guy around my family <laughs> maybe that's supposed to be like the metaphor of like uh like intrusive thoughts happen so you can't really like tell your family that you're into like sadomasochism because you don't want them to like think I guess, of you like, poorly yeah yeah like think think negative thoughts about you so you kind of have to like keep it from them and then you have all these intrusive thoughts whenever you're around them like oh man i wish i could tell my wife that i'd really like to you know, beat her this evening, but I can't because you know she wouldn't be cool with that. <laughs> the kid, you know, it's it's all well and good, like uh, having your spouse walk around in a dog collar, but uh, when the kids go to school asking about it, like that's not cool. <laughs> 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 oh, what did your daddy get your mommy for Mother's Day this year? Oh, she got her. He, he got her a new dog collar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. I think that's why nobody asks questions like that. Nobody asks, like, what did your dad get your mom for, for Mother's Day? Right. Cause right, because like, nobody wants to hear light up bl- butt plug. <laughs> 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 or even or even just the simplest answer. Like, you're a kid. You don't know what the fuck a butt plug is. And you just say, oh, we got her a toy. And then the, the teacher on the other side of the room is, like, listening to this. And is like... like mm. <laughs> just like a Lego? And he's like, I don't know. They won't let me see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> jesus christ you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you did not know that itchy the killer was based on a manga yeah and- i uh i was looking at blurbs and i had only just like i read that and i was like to be fair i can kind of see it like there's a lot of stylistic choices where i'm like oh yeah if somebody drew this it'd be a badass fucking scene as someone who's entirely ignorant of this uh i had, i do have to say that i'm concerned that it's going to just be like the live action death note movie or the live action full metal alchemist movie or like y- you know what i'm talking about oh for sure i feel like i feel like it's one of those things where like when you've seen one that is the iteration that it has to be and then for somebody to be like we're gonna flip the script and we're gonna do claymation death note th- then you just sort of cringe away from it and so i wonder if that's to my benefit having seen this and not any other iteration like if, if there had been an anime about this shit and then i saw this i because i didn't even watch the live action death note or any of that stuff because it just it feels so cringy to me before any of the live action uh like the more modern live action movies that keep coming up on netflix i had seen the live action guyver movie the one that stars mark hamill well it doesn't star mark hamill mark hamill's in it and i had not seen the guyver animated series so i'm just watching this thing and being like holy shit this is like this is my shit this is what this is what i want in a movie you know it's got all the practical effects it's kind of goofy you know, and I was young when I watched it, so I didn't even know who the fuck Mark Hamill was. Years later, realizing, you know, Luke Skywalker's in this fucking movie. What the fuck? I was still at that, like, age where I thought that, uh, you, you'll, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say it. Uh, where you think that, like, an actor is only in the one thing. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. They, they can only ever be that one. Man, I still feel that way about, uh, fucking twilight man like uh i i watched the harry potter movie that he's in and he was such a non-character to me that when i saw twilight i was like yeah his career is over this is all he's ever gonna do 
so yeah then i found out he was in shit before and since and i was like well, good for him but like can't watch a damn thing without being like yep that's twilight man yeah i think it's because it's one of those things that you learn without anyone ever telling you like nobody sits anybody down and is like yeah L- luke skywalker mark hamill the actor who plays luke skywalker he can act in things that are not star wars no one ever sits you down and explains that to you so you have to like figure it out on your own so i think that most people are kind of just in that headspace where they're like okay i, I figured this thing out on my own but i'm not a thousand percent sure it's true <laughs> right like i haven't had a professional tell me so i'm still kind of like is that really mark hamill no <laughs> Right, not, not a lightsaber <laughs> in his hand, and it it sucks because uh, like when when you're so hard on for the one character the person's played, a- anything else they're in feels that way. It feels like it's they're trying to go that way, and sometimes they just capitalize on it. Like you know how there's this trope that Sean Bean has to die. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, like, they stuck him in Game of Thrones, and, like, wouldn't you know it, he's the first dude to get off. But, like, they didn't have to do that. Or me seeing Twilight Man and anything else, it's not about vampires, it doesn't have to be. But you, you see you see Mark Hamill as Mark Hamill, and you're like, any minute now, the lightsaber's coming out. And even with Robert Pattinson, you know, being in Twilight, and that's his big iconic role that everybody knows him from. And then to see him play Batman, and you're like, well, this, it's not that this has nothing to do with vampires. <laughs> <laughs> He's just, oh god, I made that fucking joke and I'm gonna keep making it where it's just like his whole career is based off of bats. He was in Twilight, he was in Batman, he was in that really good movie, Water for Bats. (laughs) I have heard good things about Water for Bats. But yeah, so I was watching Guyver... Uh, and then I found out that there was an anime for Giver, and I watched that and loved it. I loved the anime for Giver. I thought it was so cool and so much fun. And it like, it fucking gets there like emotionally and like, Hey, we're just going to go big. You know, it's not just a corporation that's doing a shitty thing. It's actually aliens who are doing a shitty thing. And the aliens are actually from whatever alien came down to create humans in the first place. And then actually humans are, and like, it just, it just gets bigger and bigger and crazier. And the whole time you're like, Yes, go go on. Do tell, sir. <laughs> so um, there is a part of me that's that's concerned about that with with uh, Itchy the Killer because I know that it comes from a manga, and I'm sure that there's an animated version of it somewhere, or at least like an OVA or maybe even just one of those like uh, straight to the internet kind of things. I, yeah. I'm concerned that there's going to be an aspect of this that's like that super weird Japanese shit where it's like actually Itchy's made out of squids. And yeah, it's like it's like if they tried to do a live action JoJo's, like there would just be something off about it. Oh, my sweet summer child. There is, isn't there? Yeah. And it's off? Um, it's hit or miss. Some people like it more than others. Well, so it's one of those things where like there's tropes in mangas and and animes, like the the laughing behind the the hand and like the the Akira the side bicycle fucking yeah. sweep. It's uh, there's shit that's just like iconic and you see it and then like you see it in in the wrong format and it just doesn't feel the same. Like it doesn't feel like it belongs there. It's you, you know like you're never you're never going to see the villain in real life. You're never going to see a man monologuing uh, to his captured hero or whatever. I think my concern is that when when somebody's doing a manga series, it's pretty expansive. Anytime you try to abridge something like that down to a nice hour and a half movie, something gets lost. And I, having not seen the original, I'm concerned that like maybe there's parts of this that I missed. That people are like, oh no, if you actually read the manga, he he was fed sweet potatoes as a kid and, and he hated that. And so he turned around and inflicted all of that pain that the sweet potatoes gave him right on to the populace. So in defense of abridged versions of like very expansive uh, manga series, Akira, you know, since you mentioned it, is uh, probably one of the best adaptations of a manga ever. As it turns out, the manga is better than the movie only because they hadn't finished the manga by the time the movie was being made. And they ended up finishing it after the movie was made. And that's why it was better because they had like that foresight to be able to say, well, the, here are some things that the movie doesn't cover that we would like to be able to cover better. And certainly there were there were parts of it that like get covered less in the movie than in the manga, like before the ending. I think that like sort of the magic sweet spot for making a an adaptation uh, of a manga into a live action or into an animated film or something like that into a feature film is probably uh, that two hour time mark, I guess. If you can, if if you can get a, a green light on two hours worth of film, usually I think that that gives you a little bit more leeway, a little bit more time to put in the sweet potato uh, background story kind of thing instead of you know having to drop it. I guess we, we've definitely run into our fair share of movies that 
got the extra half hour and botched it, though. Yeah, probably one of the most famous movies that's like known for doing this is uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Ghost can't do it. No, I mean, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank God that movie never became famous. I wouldn't want to date people who are like, yeah, I love Ghost Can't Do It. It's my favorite romantic movie. I'd be like, cool, see yourself out. Yep. Who go groomed on, you? Go on and get. Um, no, um, Forrest Gump. Oh. Yeah, Forrest yeah. Gump is like known for doing this. There's a whole portion of it where he just like, for no fucking reason in the middle of the movie, just decides to run across country. And like some of the most beautiful shots ever taken in a film are included in this portion of the movie. But fucking why? And I'm sure that there's some like fucking Forrest Gump fanboy out there who's going to fucking respond to this and be like, oh, well, it's because and his his character needed to and, you know, for the plot actually. Look, man, I get that there are probably very good ways to sort of like excuse this in the in the movie as it stands but it's a movie. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to, you don't have to follow any given, like, if we, if we want to show that the male character has feelings and emotions, we have to have his best friend die and then he's allowed to cry now. Like, no, he can just you can just cry for next to no reason that could be a good way to show that like it doesn't have to specifically be his best friend died or his wife just left him or something like catastrophically devastating in order to show like a character crying or a male character crying if it's a female character we can just have them cry over any old thing because hollywood shitty i don't but think people- i have the the imagination to think about how to do the forrest gump running across the country scene better because it does like evolve in a certain way but I, d- I get what you're saying, where there's a lot of... Did did we have to have the minute and a half shot of him running before we went to the next shot of him running where something else happens? Uh, I believe that the Forrest Gump running scene takes almost 10 minutes out of the movie. Yeah, that sounds about right. I, I get it, man. A lot of people like that scene. I'm just not one of them. Yeah, right? I get that. I don't have like a solution on hand right now. I'll probably try to think of something the next time I watch Forrest Gump. I'd have to rewatch the movie. Fucking Lord. It just feels like there's got to be something better than, yeah, he just, and then he just runs and he figures out that like he's had a tough go of it or something or other. And- well, he starts a cult. That's, that's how that, that scene culminates. He's got a cult of people running with him across the country. Yeah, but I don't think that that's the point of the scene because as soon as he stops running, he never like talks about the cult ever again or it's never. <laughs> It's just kind of like, yep. God, I mean, so when you talk about a movie just being allowed to do whatever the fuck they want to do, I'd love how that this they got this whole build up and he's got a cult of people following him and he just stops and turns around. He's like, yeah, I think I'm done with that. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and I think it's supposed to be emblematic of Forrest Gump's like entire journey where he will do something and people will get really into it because he's doing it. And then he'll just be like, oh, I'm not doing this for you people. I'm doing this because I want to do it. And I'm just... I don't care about it anymore. So I'm done. And then the people are kind of just like, we'll either keep doing this or we won't. But like, damn, Forrest really like was a trailblazer. And like, he's the reason we all did this. What the fuck? (laughs) The fact that I can connect those. So those two things so easily and that you hear it and you probably haven't watched Forrest Gump in months or even years. And you're just like, yeah, that is, that is kind of Forrest Gump's thing where he'll like do something and then people will get really into it and then they'll follow him and then he'll move on to the next thing and they'll either keep doing it or they won't, but they really only got into it because of him. The fact that I can connect those so easily just means that the rest of the movie already taught us that so well that it didn't need this piece here to make that clear. Right. I don't know. Forrest Gump was like, a a lot of it is just so fucking bizarre. When we, when we go over into foreign filmmaking, we're going to have a lot of moments where it's like, this isn't American filmmaking. So it feels bizarre. But I do think that there are some things that like, that are just going to be the Forrest Gump of a Japanese movie where it's even bizarre to Japanese people where they're like, why the fuck is this here? So I'm, I'm, Interested to see if we'll see anything like that in Itchy the Killer. But we are coming up right around on time here. Is there anything else that we have before we hop right into the movie? I God, there's so much I want to talk about that has to wait for the the second half of this. Because, God, I hope you're... Are we going to watch this together, man? Are you going to go off on your own and watch this shit? Because there's just some scenes I need your fucking naked reaction on. If you think that it would be best to do the, the, the movie as a team, as a unit... Then I will I will make that happen this this time. Okay, yes. we can we can do that if that's what you if that's what you need. <laughs> Honestly, there's just one scene that I really just need you to fucking. <laughs> God. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I will I will do that for you, sir. No, oh, phenomenal. But hey, that's about enough recording for today. About fucking fifteen minutes of this is probably going to get cut. Uh, just just make sure you keep in that line about like I would die for this company because I feel like that's something people need to hear and realize how ridiculous it is. I'm definitely cutting that. I'm not- <laughs> <laughs>
So we'll just we'll get into it right now, and we'll we'll be back with the movie here shortly. So I'm sorry, awful. my lord. I've forgotten the mustard. Okay. Well, uh, and, and uh, we are back. The mustard. Uh, we are we are back from watching Itchy the Killer. And there are a lot of things to say about this movie. I think that you know we should probably say first. This movie has a lot of content in it that is not appropriate for all eyes uh, or all people, all walks of life. You you can see why when I when I saw the tags as like an action com- uh, an action crime thing or something like that. Mm-hmm. Am I pretty accurate in saying that like my child childhood self seeing this as a horror movie is like closer to accurate it's a torture porn film it is going out of its way to celebrate gratuitous acts of violence and to try to derive a feeling in its audience from those acts right and i want to say that in that endeavor this movie certainly succeeds i think that none of the people that we watched it with didn't feel a certain type of way about these 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 events that it's showing me and the way that it's showing them to me feel so unapologetic and so celebratory in these things that I am that a normal person would see and say oh hey you know I'm I don't like this this puts me off in some way and I use the word normal uh, in this case not your to average mean, film goer not yeah, <laughs> like, not to know, say you're a disassociative freak for watching these movies it's just the the average if you polled 100 people, 80 of them would probably not have the kindest of words to say about this movie. And certainly the different kinds of reactions you're going to get out of this movie are going to be wildly different. But this movie isn't made for the average film goer. It is made for a very specific audience of people. And I'm sure that those people really appreciate the fact that this movie exists. We've talked in the past on this podcast about how the best thing a movie can do is specifically make one small group of people feel like somebody gets me. Somebody out there understands like the the strange ways or the very specific ways that I feel about the world. And I think that this movie is certainly very much trying to connect with one or two small groups of people on that note. You mentioned that uh, you're, you're not horribly pleased with how this has presented its subject matter uh, when viewed through our modern lens. What, what exactly did you mean by that? Any modern person should be able to see this movie and see the way that it depicts rape and the way that it talks about rape. And it should be noted that I'm a big advocate for showing and noting the fact that rape exists exists in film. But this movie specifically goes out of its way to say a couple of things. One of which is like, well, if you get raped, you're going to end up liking rape. You're going to be turned on by rape. That's what happens. If you get raped, you become a sexual deviant or you become somebody who really likes the idea of rape or getting raped or raping other people. That is one of the things that the movie specifically tries to push forward. Yeah. And I think that through a modern lens, most people are willing to agree. Not appropriate. That's not right. It pushes that. It pushes the idea of like, like a person who's being raped wanting somebody else to be doing the raping and not the person who is doing the raping. That just flies in the face of the idea of rape in general or the idea of consent in general. You're not consenting to the sex. Why would you consent to it if it were just somebody else doing it? That fulfills only a very small group of like incidences and not like the wide gambit of rape and sexual assault. I, I'm going to be honest. I didn't see it that way uh i'm assuming you're talk- talking specifically about the two scenes where itchy himself is being like no she just wanted me to do it and also the one where the woman is pretending to be tachibana or whatever mm-hmm. yeah so how did you how did you read it i viewed this as itchy being like horribly unwell um, yes he is that, he is clearly meant to be mentally unstable right mentally mentally unhealthy in some way at, at some point it's finally revealed that he killed his parents and is just mentally unhinged and so this this story that that's been fed through the whole movie is a complete fabrication yeah and they, they talk um, about it as if it's hypnotism so it makes it kind of seem like itchy is somewhat of a victim right i mean we don't know the story of why he killed his parents or whatever but he's definitely like a tragic character here and the other one that's the uh, masochistic woman there. Or I don't know if she's masochistic and trying to be more sadistic, but the one where, you know, they're pulling on that guy's cheeks and she's like, I want in on this. And then she's trying to be more um, more violent towards, I forget the guy's name with the, with the cut cheeks and the blonde hair, but she's trying to be more violent with him. And I think she just has her own sort of sexual gratification that she's going towards because it's not, I guess I don't know perfectly uh, how to describe this, but there are people who have 
the rape fantasy. And it seemed like that was in her sadistic pursuits. She's like, oh, this is somebody that can really, you know, give me something good here. And then, you know, she's quickly like, oh, this guy's fucking serious. Yeah, no, I don't I don't want this anymore. Hmm. Like, it, it didn't it didn't scream to me that it was saying what you're saying, uh, though. I, I can I can see that interpretation. It's just not what I picked up. So the, the blonde man with the scars is Kakihara. Yes. And on the note of the fact that there are people who do have a uh, consensual non-consent fantasy, and that's the that's the appropriate word for it, by the way. Uh, okay. If you're ever looking to uh, say that out loud again, it isn't a rape fantasy because that can't really exist, right? If you're right. having, I a, get, yeah, I get what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Uh, it can't be a rape fantasy. It can only either be rape or consensual sex. Like a, a rape fantasy doesn't really exist because once you're like, no, I specifically want it to happen to me non-consensually. Now it's just literally rape. Right. If you're unfamiliar with the term or you're unfamiliar with the concept, it can be kind of jarring to hear about it for the first time, right? And so you don't know and you're just like, well, that's just a rape fantasy. And there, there is a distinction. There is like... I, I understand that there's a distinction. I think it's a it's a nomenclature thing, but I, I do I do get what you're trying to push. I guess there, there's somebody out there that can hear me say rape fantasy and think like, oh, they fantasize about actual rape. What I mean is the fetish of what you're saying, the consensual, non-consensual sex. Yeah, I get that. There are some times where we just use shorthand and what we mean is something else. I get that. There are a lot of people who are very quick to be like, well, if the if the person has, you know, piercings and tattoos and uh, they're into a consensual non-consent thing, then they must also be into being tied up or having, you know, uh, chains put on them or so on and so forth. But that's not true, right? Like, that's the, that's the issue that we have in sexuality today, probably. Probably. I mean, I'm not saying it's the only issue, but it's one of them where people don't specifically and explicitly say, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. Don't do these things. Please do these things. They kind of let the uh, unspoken sort of aspect of this speak for itself. If you have tattoos, that means you're into kinky sex. Those are the rules. Which, which is unfair for people who are very God, What's <laughs> I'm just going to say vanilla, even though I'm sure there's a correct term for that as well. Sure. Um, there, there are plenty of people with freaky piercings and tattoos who don't want anything uh, outstanding like that. And there's plenty of uh, down-to-earth looking folk who are the exact opposite. Yeah, um, and it's it's really just unfair to have to make those assumptions. There is a movie that we still need to watch for this podcast and unfortunately it'll probably never be available. We'll just have to break the rules for this one eventually. That specifically does talk about this. The idea that like everyone is always wearing a uniform to let people know, hey, this is the game I'm playing right now and if you know the game and you see what I'm wearing you'll know that I'm playing and I think that's exactly what we're hitting on here is that if you're wearing you know a business suit and you're going on your first date in a business suit it's not because you're just somebody who wants to look nice and professional and you know inviting it's because you're vanilla as fuck and you're not trying to do any kinky weird sex stuff and there's a lot of people that adhere to and follow that ideology in their everyday life you know which is just I mean it's an awfully roundabout way of you know getting to the much easier aspect of hello my name is my name is Oreo Man, and I'm into the freaky sex stuff, instead I've, of having to put on a costume. I've genuinely had people tell me that I, I, I look the way that I look, and that means that I'm into XYZ. And that's that, that feels really inappropriate. It makes me feel like they're willing to trust their own assumptions more than they're willing to trust what you have to say. And I've literally had it where I've been like, no, you're misjudging me. I, I like these things. Uh, you can trust me because it's coming from the horse's mouth. I'm literally telling you I have no reason to lie at this point. And they're like, no. I know. I've seen your kind before. I know what you're about. It's it's insulting and it's and it's 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 very rude. God, I, and any sentence that includes your kind it has <laughs> got to be like up on the list of shit you need to stop saying. <laughs> In 2022 of all times as well, like Jesus right. fucking Christ. <laughs> This wasn't even like many moons ago. In the, in the distant year of 2000. <laughs> so so speaking of the distant year 2000, do you think that this movie and the way that it feels about like sexual assault, rape, gratuitous violence and things like that is a result of the fact that it came out in 2001? Or was it just a result of the people making it in the way that they wanted to specifically target a specific group of people? I, I think this is a very specific movie targeting people. And I kind of wish, knowing that this is from a manga, I just, I just think manga, the, the world of manga is really... There, who's the guy that does... He's very famous for doing horror. Um, Jinji Ito. Yes, Jinji Ito. Imagine if it was some... If, 
Tell me he's got a live action movie based on his manga right now. Oh, my sweet summer child. Yes, he does. Well, there you go. Uh, I think that this is a similar situation where where this manga was gratuitous in its own right, or maybe it was trying to say something that wasn't captured here, or maybe it was captured here. I think they just translated that onto the screen one for one. I do think, and this is something I'd like to take a stand on now because it has come up in the past and I haven't taken a stand on it and I'm going to do it now. Americans... And I don't know if it's just Americans, but I've lived in America most of my life, and I can say with some degree of certainty, Americans like to conflate horror and gratuitous violence as being the same thing, and they are not. Um, Junji Ito specifically deals a lot with the Lovecraftian style of horror in the tradition of something is happening, we don't know what it is, we can't explain it, it's very gross, it's very alien to us. And it's a lot. That's what Junji Ito, sort of in a nutshell, is trying to touch upon. And I think that certainly there are elements of it that are uh, body horror. That does come up quite frequently. Body horror is also felt in uh, Itchy the Killer. There's a lot of like, hey, something's happening to this person's body. It doesn't look like it would be very good. Horror is being generated from that. But to say that these two are in any way like comparable or like touching on similar topics outside of that body horror element, I think is a is an injustice to Junji Ito. I, I'm definitely not trying to say that. O- only that, like, in the way that Junji Ito is trying to evoke a certain feeling, whoever created Ichi the Killer, the manga, was trying to evoke their own feeling. I, I do think that that's probably true. Yeah, it's, it's definitely trying to evoke feelings, but I think that that's probably true of any story, right? Uh, there's not a story around that isn't trying to evoke a feeling of some kind. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. It's difficult for me to understand why people would be so like, this is a must-see movie. I do think, I, that, yeah. I, I do think that the movie is very graphic. I do mm. think that, that Itchy the Killer is very provocative and certainly something that you probably want to be able to talk about with people. And maybe that's why it got around so much. Because I remember a lot of people talking about how Itchy the Killer is like this great movie that you need to watch and you need to be able to talk about and whatnot. And I don't think that the movie is like a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think it's a bad movie either. I definitely think that if you're interested in a torture porn film, this is probably in the top 10 and probably noteworthy for that. I just don't think that it's one of those movies that you just suggest to every single person you come across, you know, and that certainly seems like the case uh, in my experience. No, I I agree. I, I definitely wouldn't like, I'm not, I went to work and recommended uh, Samurai Cop. This is not going on that same list. But I do think for the right person, or maybe just as like an exploration of your own interests, while I recognize that it was a torture scene, uh, there was that scene where the guy was suspended from hooks, and that is a fetish in its own right. Yeah, um, and, and there are some people who are interested in having hot water thrown on them, and he wasn't. it was oil, and it was boiling, and it was meant to be torturous. But when you're into that fetish, you kind of pretend like it's hot oil being poured on you, right? Well, well, yeah, that's the thing. There's there's a lot of things that people fetishize, and in their head, they're like, oh, this turns me on so much, but do not want that on them in real life. Like, so there are some people who put, like, hot wax and pour that on themselves, and there's a lot of things going on there that I, I, I can't really say too much on, because I'm not particularly familiar. I imagine the sensation of the wax itself as it cools off and feels different between, like, being you know, really, really hot to being like not so hot and like solidifying. That's probably a good sensation. There's just so many things here that to try to like say that this scene specifically was meant to capture everything about that. I I think it would be really, really hard for any scene, even one specifically dedicated to just having hot wax uh, as the focal point. You know, this is what that sensation and that sexual gratification is like. I think that that scene wouldn't be perfect in its expression of that feeling or of that sensation or of that fetish. So it's really hard to say, you know, well, this scene, there are people who are into having hooks in their flesh. So it, somebody will be like, well, that's not a perfect representation. And it's, I don't think it ever will be. I don't think we'll ever find a perfect representation of it. So, so I agree with you. I think that, yeah, that was a good scene. We talk about this in the Titan episode where we're like, oh, I hope this movie doesn't awaken anything in me. If there was ever a movie that was going to awaken anything in you, it might very well well be itchy the killer right and i i think that um i don't i don't want to say that people need to be exposed to those types of things but it's sort of uh this idea of like you don't know what it is that you don't know until it's presented to you so so while this this uh this movie is very violent there's uh God, how do i phrase this shit man there's there's people out there that are really into amputees mm. and <laughs> and like you just don't know that 
until you watch Itchy the Killer and, and the guy has no arm. Like, or or the, the girl that's trying to sex him up gets her leg cut off and then hobbles away. Yeah, um, yeah so, somebody well, <laughs> probably won't pursue that in real life, but does fantasize about something like that. I'm sure there's got to be somebody out there. And like maybe, maybe Itchy the Killer isn't the best movie for that. You might watch Itchy the Killer and not realize you're into that and then watch... Deuce Bigelow, male gigolo, that's his main love interest as a person with uh, who is an amputee. And you're like, oh, fuck, this was handled the correct way in this movie where it's meant to be kind of romantic and it's something that he's like sympathetic but also loving towards. And I realize now I feel that way too. It's very possible for you to see Itchy the Killer and be like, this was handled in a way that I felt it was disgusting and inappropriate. But in another movie and suddenly you're like, oh, well, but Itchy the Killer didn't scratch that itch for me because it and so on. You know, there, there, there are going to be instances where any given movie that is meant to like awaken people to the idea of a certain thing are going to see it and just be like, ah, this wasn't done the way that it makes sense to me or where it clicks with me. And then watch a separate movie covering similar subject matter and be like, oh, wait, no, this is doing it. Yeah, and there, there's just no way to know without exposing yourself to those things. I do think that we've been somewhat harsh on Itchy the Killer here, and it, it would be very easy for somebody to listen to this and think, oh, so they just didn't like the movie. There are a lot of things to really love about this movie. It's almost a comedy. Yeah, there's definitely parts that I think where they try to pull comedy out of some of the more uh, gory situations. The, it, there are parts of this movie that are fun. The the old man that everybody's picking on because he's a tiny little old man ending up being a fucking bodybuilder. <laughs> Yeah, like that, that was a, fun. <laughs> being, being a jacked human, and yeah, <laughs> and like he's not even like like he he has discombobulated this guy. He punched him or kicked him or whatever he did, and then he disarmed the guy's gun off of him. And then after only after doing both of those things, and the guy's on the ground like heaving, like <gasps> he doesn't feel good. He can't defend himself. Then he takes the time to take five steps away and then start disrobing himself down to a speedo and then flexing on this guy as if he's. A, it's fucking funny. You know, mm. uh, I, uh, it was a little bit, uh, I felt the humor was a little childish when, like, uh, the, this goon squad, the the few remaining people that are, are backing Ka- Kakihara? Yeah, Kakihara, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, they're like, well, if she won't talk, we'll have to get Detective So-and-so. And he puts on fucking dog ears and sniffs the guy out. Oh like, my that, god. That was that was fun. <laughs> like, oh. And then he, it's just his silhouette in the mirror, and then it's this wacky chase through the house. And, and Kakihara's fucking corner of his lip piercings that apparently hold his whole fucking face together. So he eats the man's hand. Like, there's just something wild about that whole series of events that, like, while gory and, like, yeah, he he bites the guy's hand and, like, the, the guy's got skin missing or whatever. But there's just something outlandish to the point of caricature in that scene compared to the rest of the movie. I do think if there is something to be said of this movie and the message it's trying to get across, it's that you cannot judge a book by its cover. And also, you shouldn't assume that just because something is awful or bad or terrible, that there isn't something else way worse right around the corner. And I think that Kakihara's character brings us both of those things very quickly. We sort of judge Kakihara to be like that Yakuza badass who's seen some shit. You know, he's got all these scars and these fucking, you know, piercings and other and whatnot. These things that we look at and we think like, that guy's a fucking badass. But he's also very funny and he's kind of like a weird superhero in a way. He's, he's a really silly character, but also a total badass as well. So he sort of fits into the mold while also not fitting into the mold. He's not the big bad of the movie. The big bad of the movie is uh, Itchy. Itchy is a fucking lunatic. He's a person we're not supposed to like. And at the same time, he's also kind of tragic in his own right. I guess technically the big bad is the old man who turns out to be a bodybuilder. Uh, um, yeah, who ended up masterminding this whole thing. Yeah, like he's kind of behind everything and he's manipulating, pulling all the strings and whatnot. And certainly Itchy is performing the acts and maybe takes them a little too far sometimes. But uh, that's because he's mentally unwell. He has like, he's got like some trauma that he's working through. Also, he has this old man manipulating him through some degree of hypnosis. This is the craziest superhero movie ever made. But it's it's not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination. It is certainly very entertaining and it's got its like high points. I think it's just that the low points are so fucking much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Can we just talk about how Kakihara had that drip? Dude, he was fly the whole... 
every scene we see him in, it's like they're they're chasing him in slow motion, and he's got like the iridescent two tone suit and the fucking see through shirt. Even when he's fucking, he's like, "I'll pay my penance. I'll cut my tongue out." Uh, which I kind of like that scene. He's like, "You'll pay for this," and it's well, I like sweets, and he's like, "What the fuck does that have to do with anything?" Well, gonna cut my tongue out. Can't have sweets anymore. That's a good punishment, right? And then with his fucking Joker purple suit, he pulls out a neon green, like, the sheerest of, of silks to fucking wear as a as a bib for him to cut his tongue out. Uh, the, his cute little neckerchief he has on him, you know? That thing's yeah, horrible. But, like, every time we see him, everybody else is in, like, pretty pretty standard suits. I think the only person who had a suit was the, the cop guy. He had, like, a shiny leather suit at some point. But then we cut over to Kakihara, and he's like, no, 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 I've got... A two-piece plaid suit. The two-piece plaid suit. I thought that shit was lit. I'd buy a suit like that and just go around in it. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, but Kakihara, like, himself is, uh, I don't know. I, I was really fixated on this whole, like, hey, the, everybody says that you're in love with the boss. Like, he never denies it. And at some point, we, we break that down to be like, no, no, no. The boss brutalized you or whatever, and you, you've never found somebody that can feed that masochistic portion of your brain the way this guy has. And that's why you're searching for him. We, we get evidence of it later on where the the girl is like i'll be your girl and he's like well if you're gonna be my girl you got to be able to do this and she's not able to do it and she's disappointed and maybe to a degree as an audience member you might be disappointed as well you know like dang it i thought he'd be able to find somebody and they would be able to fulfill that need for him but he says definitively you can't do this as well as the boss and so you're not you can't fulfill this position for me i remembered uh these two so i brought up in the the preamble to this movie asking if you thought they'd have a love interest and technically they both do in their in their own psychopathic roundabout way well so so let's let's talk about that really quick kakihara i do not know definitively if he is psychopathic uh so much as he is just he has a lot of interests that are looked down upon in a way where it's like well only a mentally unwell person would want someone to punch them in the face repeatedly or would want to torture another person and maybe this movie is trying to like pick that apart because kakihara is like he knows what he wants when the girl is trying Trying to punch him in the face and he's like no you're not doing it correctly he doesn't like fuck with her or anything he just says you're not doing this right you need to leave i'm done with you and certainly uh things like that happen in the dating realm even today where if you can't play properly with the person if you can't do the things that they want a like sadomasochistic kind of way in a bdsm sort of realm uh they don't want to be partners with you because you can't fulfill that need of theirs and there are some people who can separate it where they're like i have a sexual partner and then i have a play Play partner who just beats me up exactly the way I want to be beaten up and then I go home all horny and turned on and whatnot and have sex with my regular sex partner. I do not have sex with my play partner, but I do have sex with my sex partner. There are people who do separate it that way. And I think Kakihara, maybe, maybe not very gracefully, better than a lot of movies we've ever had covering this subject matter. I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey is garbage at this. Kakihara might be trying to, as a character, might be trying to talk about that or at least introduce audiences to the idea of this. There can be a very beautiful woman who wants to have sex with you, but she cannot fulfill your very specific sexual kink, and therefore you have to part ways. That does sound graceful. I do like that interpretation of it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I really like the character of Kakihara. I think Ichi is the character who I find the most difficulty with. And it's hard because Ichi really is meant to be sympathetic for us. We're supposed to feel bad for him. But the ways that he views and expresses outwardly about the various different sexual interests that he has make him hard to like. Right. During that point in the movie where it's like, oh no, he killed his parents and I created this story here that's just been fucking with him. Like, I think at that, I think that's a turning point for me at the very least. Like, how, how do you, how do you feel about that? Like, clearly he's unwell. And he doesn't deserve, like, a, any disparagement for the fact that he's unwell. But... He's being know, manipulated. I, He's, he is being manipulated, but we, yeah. we never see, like, why he killed his parents or... Shit, are we even really sure that he killed his parents? Because the, the mastermind behind this whole operation who lied and hypnotized Itchy could be lying there, too. I guess we don't really know. I, I'm going to assume that that part is correct, and it's just... I guess he's not he's not a character you're meant to like, but it's an odd tragedy 
revolving around Itchy. There is a weird amount of sympathy that this movie has for the character of Itchy. And I think that it's supposed to just make our relationship as audience members with Itchy more complicated and more difficult for us. Yeah. I think that it certainly succeeds on that. If it's trying to do that or not trying to do that, I don't know. But it definitely succeeds on making my relationship with Itchy less, oh, I just hate that character. He sucks. And more like, uh, it's kind of hard to say exactly. This movie had a weird relationship with blowjobs. It felt like blowjobs would come up more often than like regular sex for some reason. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> Whoever did the audio design for that last blowjob scene before the, the chick gets her foot cut off, yeah. like that was spot on. Mwah, chef's kiss there. I, I um, will say as a dramatization of what a blowjob sounds like, I think that it is, it's it's pretty solid. Better Better than some that I've heard. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I, I guess that is true. Like the the weird blowjob uh, scenes. Like I feel like there's only two of them. There are there are two that I can remember, but there are only two other scenes that involve sexuality that are not or that involve direct penetrative sex that are not blowjob scenes, and both of them are rape scenes. Yeah. So like, whenever we're getting penetrative sex, flip a coin, and it'll it'll tell you whether or not you're getting a blowjob scene or a rape scene. And I'm sure there's arguments to be made that those blowjob scenes sort of deteriorate into rape scenes. It depends on how much scrutiny you want to give it. I definitely think this is one of those movies that requires scrutiny on who you suggest to watch it, but uh, I do I do celebrate it's, you know, the fact that it exists. I think it's a, I think it's a good movie. It's well made in general and it certainly does try very hard to thread that needle. How do you how do you feel about the ending? Cuz I think there's like something really special there about Kakihara like not getting that culmination that he he wanted. Kakihara wanting so badly to be able to receive that same kind of feeling that uh, Anjo, the boss of the gang, Anjo, was giving him and not being able to get to that point. He talks a lot in that, that scene about like, at least in the subtitled version, this is the kind of movie that I feel like I should watch again with the dubs just to see if there's any uh, discrepancies because sometimes the discrepancies will tell you a little bit more about what maybe they were going for there. He talks a lot about how like he just wants someone to be able to kill him and I wonder if that's like a, a mystery translation and maybe it's more like i don't want him to kill me i just want him to give me give me that same masochistic feeling that i've had in the past and he he definitely talks about that leading up to the big confrontation with itchy he talks about how like oh i've never felt this anxious before not ever since this one interaction i had i'm scared both of what i will do and what he will do i'm you know concerned about that and it's it's i think it's him just describing a complicated feeling using words that he thinks the other person will understand. That is, sort I, of I was also pretty con like confused about his use, his and the woman's use of despair in their little monologues there. Yeah, uh, the word despair comes up a lot in uh, Japanese media covering these sort of like difficult topics. I've seen quite a few different uh, Japanese movies and anime and, and manga where they specifically use the word despair. They're looking for true despair and so on. So I think that that is specifically a word that they're trying to use that doesn't translate perfectly into English. And I'd like to know more about what specific word it is and the, what is it, the etymology or whatever behind it, the word history and word science behind it. I don't know what it is exactly, but I have seen that phenomenon in the past and I wonder what specifically they are trying to get at. But I, I know what you're talking about. I agree that did come up more than one or two times. I can't be sure a hundred percent how much of the ending, especially the, the leading up to the ending, was real and how much of it was fake. I know that at a certain point they change the cinematography to be more stylized. And in those moments, the character sort of gets, you know, axe kicked in the face and then pushed off of the uh, stairwell and then they fall to their death. But then after that, they go back to normal and uh, Gigi shows up to inspect uh, Itchy's body and it's back to normal and he also doesn't have the like head wound anymore right. so it seems like there's a possibility but it didn't actually happen that kakihara jumped off and itchy is still up there just crying on the ground and kakihara killed himself as a result of being so disappointed in itchy's encounter with him and i think it's up to us to sort of decide that it's crazy that the movie does such a good job of making us like so interested and involved in kakihara's character yeah i'm so that's the i, I wish i had um well no because because in the blurb we do mention that it's kakihara and it itchy but it's so wild that the movie is titled itchy the killer and he is not the character i was drawn to or even the character who we spend most of the movie following yes uh the protagonist is very much kakihara uh, and it's hard to say that because he is a character that we're kind of meant to look at as like a villainous dude 
we're supposed to look at him and like, oh, gross, this guy is... The, the movie is almost full of villainous characters, right? The only, like, good guy character is the, the ex-cop who lost his gun. He's, like, the only heroic character, Kaniko. He has, like everything to lose and he's trying his best to do the right thing and to be good at his current job he is sort of the everyman character and he gets next to no screen time he's barely on it we know his story and that's about it i also i, I want to know if there was a something lost in translation there because <laughs> the cop got fired because he lost his gun clearly this couldn't be like yep well, well boss i misplaced my pistol well that's it you're <laughs> You're off the force. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ignorant American pig fucker, please recognize that firearms are a much more serious thing in Japan. Sure. So misplacing your firearm as a police officer in Japan is a huge deal. It is not treated the same way as it is in America. And in America, if a police officer just misplaced his firearm and can't find it or whatever, that is still a big deal here. I don't know if you would be completely off of the force for something like that, but you'd certainly be in, in hot water. No, I believe that. It just, it seems like such an odd backstory. Well, I guess he's not a main character, is he? So he's he is meant to be like the puppy of the group. He's the person that we're supposed to be most sympathetic towards and most like he he never did not know nothing wrong he's he's a good sweet perfect angel boy and that's how we're supposed to feel about him he has like a little bit more dimension to his character than i'm giving him with this description of him as a puppy but in general i think that most audiences would see him as like the the regular guy basically he's just in this situation because you know he lost his job as a police officer and now he has to pick up whatever work he can and it just so happens that they know that he's a good shot so he now works for the yakuza as a hired gun basically and i i do think that there is a difference between the way that we treat gun handling in america versus how they treat it in Japan. In Japan, they are very, very strict about it. They do not want guns on the streets. If you lose your firearm, you put a gun on the streets, man. That's, no, that's unacceptable. Why, why do you think the old fart man killed himself at the end there? Oh, shit, I didn't I didn't catch that. No? No, I must have missed it. Yeah, so that, that scene at the end where um, all the little children in yellow hats and the son oh, of oh, the cop no, man. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I did see that. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I misunderstood. When you said he killed himself, I thought, for some reason, I thought you meant that he, like, actually killed did it like on screen oh no his... it's just him hanging there yeah 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 yeah. sorry i misunderstood what you were saying because because it seemed like he had this grandiose plan and i'm still not even sure what his goal here was aside from because this was just one yakuza dude really and like his very specific or maybe just this specific family the the anjo family or whatever it's not like the guy has removed yakuza from existence yeah, there's still the other group, the guy that, uh, the, the group that specifically supported the Suzuki guy. Right. So, that, so there's at least them. Uh, we can assume there's more than that because after they're like, after he says, uh, "Oh, I'm, uh, I'm taking control of the Anjo group," they're like, every, every family in town is gonna be our enemy now. So I'm assuming they weren't just talking about the one there. There's got to be more. Uh, back to my point. Old Fartman has eliminated one family at, at best, if we can say that. So, so why does he feel like he can kill himself and remove himself from this? This just right. might be one of those things that uh, we weren't tracking super well exactly what his motivations were. Because I'm also unsure on that. I don't know why he would kill himself. I thought, uh, originally, my thought was that that would be Itchy up in the uh, tree hanging himself. Which makes more sense if we're going to have a character kill himself at the end of the movie, other than the ambiguous death of Kamihara. It would have made sense for it to be Itchy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it should have been Itchy. But it wasn't. It seemed very much like... And we could be wrong. We could be just, you know, we, we missaw or misinterpreted. But yeah, it seems like it would be more appropriate for Itchy to kill himself there. A lot of Japanese movies do like to end on that point, uh, especially when they're talking about these sort of serious subject matter. They like to end on that point of like, and then everybody died. So uh, that might be it. Uh, and that's just my personal experience with them. There are a lot of other uh, Japanese movies I'd really like to do for this uh, podcast. Um, and a couple of even even uh, some Korean films do this as well. So it might just be like a, this is the understanding of drama. What would be more dramatic than ending the film on all of the main players in this movie died or killed themselves in some glorious sort of fashion? Yeah, it's a rough one. Because um, it felt like a very artistic ending. I, I did like that fucking Kakihara, uh, I'm assuming just hallucinated this ideal ending with itchy because it blew my mind when it's like he stabs his eardrums or whatever and he looks over and the kid's dead and i'm like no they didn't kill the kid <laughs> there's no way yeah that was um, pretty intense you know and everything that happened there and then I, I guess we're just meant to assume that itchy's still up there to this day getting the shit kicked out of him by a kid <laughs> 
I don't know if I think that he's still up there getting the shit kicked out of him by a kid. I think it's very possible that he just died up there, bleeding out uh, from the bullet wound and not seeking any help. That'll kill you. Yeah, I guess so. So he could just be up there crying, 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 and nobody getting him any help, and this kid fucking kicking him. The kid will get tired and fuck off eventually, but... If you're not going to go get help and like quickly, you need help now. You're just going to, you know, go into shock and then go unconscious and then bleed to death right there. So I think it's very possible that, you know, it, everybody has died for, for the sake of the movie. Yeah. I think that that's very probable. I don't know who that character was that turned around after seeing, after walking past the head. Oh, that was the kid. Oh, that was the little kid. He'd, he'd grown up a little bit. Yeah, which is even more confusing with how um how the how the old man is hanging in that tree after the kid has grown up a little. I, I'm thinking it's the kid. That that's what I got. So I thought it might have been itchy, and he just looked different for some reason. I don't know. Um, Possibly. But yeah, I'm I'm willing to admit a certain degree of that probably in this last scene here. But I don't think it was much of an issue the entire film. I remember uh, early on in the movie, I I was first concerned that it might be an issue when the the lady is getting punched and raped and whatnot, and there's a guy in the window watching, and I'm like, I can't tell which of the characters I've been introduced to that who this is supposed to be. Am I supposed to not know? I don't know. I couldn't tell what was going on. And I think the movie is trying to have you go like, oh, who's this? guy i've never seen him before and then later we get introduced to the fact that it's it's itchy but the movie does do a good job of letting you know this is itchy in the uh, title card the probably the best title card sequence in the entire history of film did you enjoy that with the bike chain and shit no no um the part where uh it shows the name of the film in itchy semen yeah all right that's pretty cool that's, that's what i'm talking about that's probably the best like hey cue the title card show us the name of this movie bam it's right in his fucking jizz and it's his name and it's the character's jizz specifically Mm. oh masterpiece oh by god so good i i feel like i i genuinely wanted to have an answer for you for this uh by the end of the movie but i do not have anything the number one and its significance um not not a clue don't have anything nope i imagine it's probably explored better in the manga i think that's one of the things that they were just like yeah stylistically this looks kind of cool i know there's an explanation in the manga but we're not going to go over it and we're just going to say hey he's got a one on his back isn't that neat man who's who's to say i bet the manga is pretty pretty explorative on that stuff because that like there was never a situation where i thought itchy was in harm's way he seemed very much like i'm just going to kill them all before they have a chance to kill me and so i don't know why he has a fucking superhero suit and and again the character with the most like superhero attributes is uh, Kakihara. He can unhinge his entire mouth. He can cut off his tongue and still use his tongue the way a tongue is meant to be used. He can take a whooping. I know. I I don't know how I felt when he's like, when they're like, you cut out your tongue and it's like, don't worry, humans regenerate. And I'm like, I don't think they do that. They, they do like a little, but not that much. Like, not, not a whole ass tip of your tongue. That lady who got her titties cut off certainly didn't regenerate those. <laughs> right. I know we already mentioned it, but I really appreciated the humor in the movie. God, I'm really happy that the dude that he stabbed in the foot still had the fucking box <laughs> attached oh. to him in the next scene. And he just keeps walking with it in his foot. Like, at no point does he have the gall to be like, I'm just going to remove this. He's too scared of Kaki <laughs> I'll just leave it in. It's fine. <laughs> I do, I do think that this movie had such good comedy in it that it's kind of wasted on a movie that's so dark. But I'm sure there are some people who the like the mileage of the comedy does a lot more for them. So they're just like, no, 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 no. It's a, the the comedy shines through despite how dark the movie is, and and therefore elevates it. And, right. and for me, I definitely think it elevates it. But I think it would have been better served in a movie that's not nearly as dark. But like, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of black comedies. I love those like dark gallows kind of humor films and, and, and even films that are like, Hey, uh, the, the comedy and the, the darkness of the film are separate. We have the comedy here and then we have the dark issues over here. Um, I think that's harder to pull off, but I, I like it when it's done well. And I think that this movie, I applaud it for trying, but I, I, I do think that the comedy is watered down by how heavy the other themes are. Well, I think, I think, I don't know what else I want to say about this movie. I enjoyed watching it. Like, I, I think it was a good, a good watch for me anyways. Like it, like it, it was it was pretty gruesome and like those parts weren't ideal. I don't know. I enjoyed it. I do think that uh, these movies very quickly sort of part the seas. You know, they very quickly let you know, and you'll know in your head. Maybe you won't realize it yourself, but your brain will let you know this is not a movie for me. I think that that happened for us, and certainly you know you and I are capable of kind of just going, well, all right, you know, it's not for me, but it still has like value and merit and worth, and I'll keep watching it. And there are going to be people who are like, no, I realize this wasn't for me, and I drop the movie immediately. Fuck this shit. And there's nothing wrong with that. I. 
I condone dipping on a movie when you decide it's time to dip. I, I agree with that sentiment. If we don't have anything else, that's fine. Let's not push ourselves to try to come up with more content. I, I prefer the idea of us, you know, closing it out once it's, you know, good to close out. You know, we can just we can just call it a day. All right.